Season two has improved in some areas, but it's asking the audience to pretend that certain things in season one never happened. From a writing perspective, this show doesn't have much to stand on anymore. For me personally, I think that there's literally only one thing that's gonna carry me through the rest of this series. Hey, this is The Sword and the Pen Reflections. It is my casual alternative to the formal channel, The Sword and the Pen, link up there. And it's a very neglected channel because I spend so much time on this one. <sighs> For those of you who don't know, I am a freelance book editor with about 20 years of experience. I'm also a video editor now, I guess, even though I have to Google how to just about everything that you see in these videos. I am Confucian. What I'm doing is taking a book series that I have never read, which in this case is The Wheel of Time, and a TV or movie adaptation that I have never seen, which is in this case Amazon's Wheel of Prime, and I compare the two to see which is doing a better job at telling a good story. I'm currently on book two, chapter 44. I tried to have it done before starting the second season, but you know how it is. Life, uh finds a way. Most of what I give is my professional opinion, but I have sugared in a lot of my personal opinion. I just have to, otherwise I don't know how I would get through this. This is actually my second time recording my season two episode one review because my first recording came out at four hours and I just can't take it anymore. I want to see mountains again. Mountains, Gandalf. For this second recording, I'm just gonna kind of wing it and see how it goes. But I think it's gonna be okay because so far, Season two seems to be doing a better job with certain writing things, such as the logical progression in a conversation. And I had a big problem with that in season one. I mean, season one, I was literally taking apart every single line that people were saying to each other because it didn't make sense half the time how they got to that line. It's like the painting, see? From far away, it's okay, but up close, it's a big old mess. So anyway, hopefully there's a little less for me to talk about in season two, even though my first recording said that there wasn't less. There was in fact maybe more. But for now, we are on season two, episode one, looking at its corresponding chapters, which appear to be chapter 13 and 18 for the Nynaeve and Egwene storyline, kinda. And then for the stuff that we see in the show that's happening with Perrin and Matt and I guess Rand, that's really hard to compare. Now in the second book, Rand and Matt and Perrin are all together with a bunch of Shinarans hunting down the horn and the knife, the, the dagger. So it's really gonna be hard to compare the two storylines, but I'm sure I'll find some things to talk about. And right before we dive into it, I wanna take a few seconds to share a big, huge thank you to my second ever My Precious Tear patron, Steve. This was my dream patron tier that I really didn't think anybody would sign up for, and my gosh, thank you. I'm a big step closer now to living the dream life, the hobbit life. I'm ready to crack open a keg and break out the potatoes and steak. Potatoes. I'll be seeing you in the Discord, Steve. The first thing that the show is doing is jumping into the perspective of the bad guys, and the book did this too. The Great Hunt did, that is. And this can be really effective if it's done right. And I do think that the show did an okay job, but it didn't use this the way that it usually is used. And I'm gonna break it down and explain. We start out with a little girl who is playing on a Aes Sedai symbol, Quendiar thing, you know, that. And she sees some Trollocs in the distance that then charge towards her. Move children, Vominos! She runs into a building and hides underneath a table and seated at the table are several mysterious people having a meeting with the Dark One. Now, classically, you would use this opportunity to say, okay, we're going to show that the bad guys have a plan. They're gonna do something specific, and it usually involves working directly against our protagonists. This allows the writer to take a breath when it comes to the narrative following the protagonists at the beginning of the story. Harry Potter made excellent use of this trick. There are several books and movies where they started out from the perspective of the bad guys, and they were discussing plans things that they had in store for Harry. So when we jumped back into Harry's perspective and we're following him around, we see that even though he's just going about life normally, there's a sense of an impending doom. It is coming towards him. The bad guys are actively working against our good guy. And sometimes you see evidence of that in the story, sometimes you don't, but no matter what, because of the intro, you know it's there, you know it's coming. So the tension isn't lost, even when all we have is Harry participating in the Triwizard Tournament, for example. 
What the Wheel of Time book did is something very similar. You have a bunch of dark friends who are cloaked, we don't know who they are, but we see little signs identifying them, like we can tell that one of them is an Aes Sedai because she's got the ring, we see that there is a Shinaran soldier, things... It's very similar to what we have in the show. And the Dark One is going around speaking to each of them, and from the perspective of our protagonist, who we don't know the identity of at this time, He's concerned because he can't tell what the instructions are being given to the other dark friends that are present at this meeting. And he sees some of them seem afraid of what they're being told to do. Some of them seem really excited about what they're told to do. And from his point of view, he's going, crap, I don't know who any of these people are. I don't know what it is that they're doing. So I can't use that to my advantage to elevate my status. And you do, when you get to him and his instructions, you see that he is supposed to be doing something specific related to Rand and Perrin and Matt. So the book did do what you traditionally do with this kind of prologue. It created that sense that the bad guy is active and coming for your good guys. The show, however, didn't really do that. You pretty much just get a bunch of people sitting around talking about the state of the world. At one point, one of the members at this table actually asks, like, should we kill Rand? And the leader bad guy basically says, Nah, I can do something with him, though. You know, sooner or later, he'll come under my control, essentially. And he says, in this age or another. And that eliminates all urgency on the part of the bad guys. It's not the worst thing ever that they've done in the show, but it certainly doesn't make it seem like they have to do anything. I mean, seriously, if I was one of these dark friends sitting around the table, I'd be making my summer vacation plans. Hey, warm sun, cool ocean breezes, Getting rip shit on ham. <laughs> Might you say we're getting hammered? Go on! <laughs> nice one. Because what does it matter if you don't do anything if eventually it'll get done anyway? Then you get a couple of things done here that, okay, the first thing was something that the leader bad guy said that made me think that this, the show might be breaking another piece of lore, and that is that he refers to Rand as the one who is not yet the dragon. And that to me says that maybe the show the show is trying to say maybe he won't become the dragon but my understanding is that you are born the dragon like it's not that you become it it's that you you are the incarnation of the dragon so or reincarnation so i don't know what the show is trying to do with this and it does seem to be breaking lore and any time that the writers in this show are breaking lore especially this early or something this fundamental to the story big warning bells that they're not going to take this story where it's supposed to go or if they do try to get to where it's supposed to go it's going to feel contrived trying to force all of our stories back on track another thing that the show does here at this point that i don't recall the book doing and this might just be my memory because I, for those of you who don't know I take care of my sister's baby during the day, so most of my reading is actually me listening to the audiobooks while I'm carrying around my niece. But I don't recall this evil bad guy revealing that he is not the Dark One. I think he referred to himself as Baalzamon, but in the show, he straight out comes out and drops very heavy hints that he is a Shamael. So he's not even the dark one, he's like just some guy. I'm the guy! Stop saying you're the guy. We all know that you're not the guy. I mean, it does explain the ending of season one and the ending of book one, where well, at least, well, especially the show, because I don't, now, Moraine did not, at least to my memory, disclose that when they get to the eye of the world that anybody who's not the dragon will die. So when we saw in the show that she does say this and then they get there and she's not the dragon, but she doesn't die, I'm kind of going, well, it wasn't that dangerous then. But this does explain that, that this wasn't the dark one. This was Ishamael. And we know that it's Ishamael, or at least we get that very strong hint that it is him, not only because of the results of season one, but also because he refers to himself as being the father of lies, which is the same thing that, um, that Stepan said when he was trying to push away, or not push away, ward away um, Ishamael. 
Okay, I kind of have to wrap up what I'm talking about with the prologue here, or it'll just go on forever. But what we see is Ishamael sort of acting like a I'm a friendly uncle kind of guy to this little girl. And he's like, oh, you don't have anything to be scared of. You don't have to be afraid of me. You know, I'm not that scary. And, you know, then he starts introducing this idea that what if what you perceive as evil is just a different perspective? He's like, you know, how do you prove that you're good or prove that you're evil? What if a Trolloc isn't actually a monster? It's just hungry. And I can get behind this because it is sort of a more true to history and real life history that is um, that, you know, you have the victor who writes the history and usually portrays themselves as the hero and the fallen enemy as evil. And so I think that this can actually be okay. The problem that I have with it is that I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Dark One wants to literally destroy all of creation. And that just doesn't seem to be something that you can logically state as being a good. It is simply a lack of existence. So I don't know what the show is trying to do here. Maybe this is where it eventually goes in the books. I don't know. I haven't read them. So you tell me. I did kind of feel sorry for that Trolloc. I mean, it looked like it was really craving a gentle and kind touch from the little girl. Hey, give me back my shark, you goat bastard! But it was attacking like it was gonna try and eat her. So, I mean, is this like a creature that if the Dark One's around, then it's friendly, and if it's not, then it's just gonna tear you apart? I mean, uh, seems kind of like a monster to me. Hey! Come on, we gotta get out of here! <laughs> Look at him! He's so cute and all alone! But anyway, let's move on. From here we're gonna go into the story of Moraine and Lan. We start out with Moraine carrying buckets of water from the bottom of a hill up to the top of a hill to fill her bath, which she then gets into and washes her clothes and then sits in the bath and seems to be looking at her body and her hands, especially missing the power, missing the ability to channel. It's not clear to me exactly what is going on, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it, I mean, I'm, it's not the show isn't doing a bad job of portraying what's probably going through her head. We see that she is distressed at this, she starts crying, curls up into sort of a fetal position, continuing to cry. I don't have much of a problem with this, except that, I mean, my gosh, that must have been a dozen trips up that hill, which would take probably all day. And if she's been doing this all day, every day, which is what is revealed later on in this episode, I mean, she should be super buff. Also, it does kind of make me go, all right, she's got a lot of time on her hands. But when I watched this episode the first time, I thought that this was like her coping mechanism, like this is how she copes. She just puts herself to work, you know, hard labor. But at the end, I really couldn't forgive her for other behavior that made this seem like it's not helping. The other thing that I thought was a little weird was the whole washing your clothes while you're in the bath. I'm washing me in my she clothes, bitch. Now, saving some of that bath water to wash is usually what would happen, or perhaps you, some of it goes into a bucket for washing clothes. It, it's just weird being in your bath, washing your clothes. I mean, I'm not an expert on how laundry was done historically, but that was a massive bathtub, first of all. And secondly, aren't your clothes disgusting? I mean, I would want to wash my body first, then get out and then wash my clothes, but whatever, okay. I'm trying to clean me and my clothes at the same time, save some water. Right. I'm saving them. Yeah, all in all, this scene did do, I think, the job of establishing that Moraine is in a sort of a depression here. She's missing the one power, doesn't really know what to do. Then we get to Lan, and he's shirtless, and he's uh, practicing his sword forms. I don't think this actor has a whole lot of experience with martial arts or dance. I'm not an expert on East Asian martial arts, but I am an expert in one form of martial arts. And you know what? I think that balance on your feet and confidence with the swing of your blade is pretty important. And I see he's a little bit wobbly in both of these respects, but it's okay. He's good to look at for me, so whatever. Before we continue, please consider liking, subscribing, and commenting, even if it's just with an emoji. It's a free way for you to support the channel, and for me, it might bring in some money from all the commercials they keep putting on my videos. Or if you're feeling really generous, you can check out my Patreon, Ko-fi, or hit the Money Heart Thanks button down below. Now, let's get back to the shit show which seems to be just a little less shitty than the last season. Then we get introduced to Adelaide and Varen, and even though Adelaide seems a little bit on the stupid side, 
I, she's my kindred spirit, clearly. I mean, I would be right there with her, sitting there with my opera glasses, like, I'm gonna watch this very tall drink of water do his sweaty exercises without his shirt on. And I liked that she tried to convince him that it's okay if you want to take your pants off too, <laughs> you know? Then Lan comes over when he sees a horseman go by and he says, ah, oh, looks like we've got another guest who's arrived. We see that the two ladies don't know who these visitors are and that apparently there has been 20 of them so far. And Lan doesn't know who they are either. So these are people who are arriving and bringing some sort of information to Maureen. And she's keeping everybody in the dark about it. And then we get into what I think is actually a pretty big problem in the show. And that is that they have taken the character of Maureen and amplified certain traits that were just barely touched on in the books. And there was a lot more to her in the books. And the thing that they've chosen to amplify is very unlikable. So she is coming across as antagonistic to basically everybody around her. In season one, anytime that she wanted something, she basically threatened other people. And we see her doing that again in this episode. So I'm guessing that they're gonna continue to do this. The problem is I think Moraine is supposed to be like one of the main heroes that we're rooting for. And she's so unlikable to all of the noble and good characters around her that it makes her somebody you don't want to root for. And the only thing that I can think is that the show wants us to believe that what she's doing has, you know, it's, it's vindictive or spiteful. But once we find out the reason for her doing all of this, we'll forgive her for all of that. And I'm like, well, I, I'm not, honestly, even if it was, I'm trying to literally save the world from ceasing to exist, which is what I think they're going at here. I, I don't think that what she's doing is forgivable. Like, is there any reason to not trust Lan with, what she is doing, because that's what goes on here, is we see that Lan really wants to know who these visitors are, and she's refusing to tell him. And the problem is that he was like her number one trusted person for, well, we assume 20 years, right? I mean, they, sh they basically shared emotions. They knew what each other were feeling all the time. So why would it be necessary to keep certain things like, I'm doing this to save the universe, a secret from Lan. Like he could, I imagine, he would be capable of understanding this sort of thing. But what we get here is her acting in a way that makes me feel like she is taking out her sulky frustration on the people around her by shutting them out. That is a very immature response. Moraine is supposed to be a very mature woman. I mean, I don't know how old she is, but I get the impression she's supposed to be pretty old because the Aes Sedai is supposed to look much younger than they actually are because using the one power keeps them refreshed and youthful and young looking. But yeah, so she brushes Lan off. And then when this traitor from Ilion comes in, this sailor, Doman, Damon, I can't remember what, what his name is, but he's in the book too. He actually is in the first book quite a bit. He sails with Rand and Matt and Tom and they form a relationship on this journey that they go on together, a friendship. And I do see a bit of a problem going forward if there, if his storyline crosses paths with Matt or Rand or Tom in the future, they're gonna have to like figure out how do we rekindle their friendship? Like he's supposed to, I imagine he's gonna be supposed to help them in some way. And the problem is that he'll have no reason to help them because they never met before. So I'm not sure how they're going to fix that. There are things that you can do to make that work, but it will be a challenge. And I, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in the writers to be able to do that. But okay, back to Maureen. We, we get her in her private conversation with this Doman, Damon. Is it Damon or Doman? It's Doman, I think. And he reveals that she threatened him to come and, and, and meet her. Like he said, I didn't have a choice really coming here. And she seems to be gleeful in her control over him, her ability to control other people in the way that she delivers her next line. Oh, everyone has a choice, Master Doman. And every choice has a consequence. Whatever, I do what I want. That is so unlikable. That is something that villains do. And it's unlikable because it does seem to be, uh, I want you to think I am enjoying the fact that I have threatened you. 
I don't think Moraine is that kind of person. See, in the book, she keeps up very amicable relationships with everybody around her, even the people she's manipulating. But she does that, I believe, because she wants it to be easy for her to deal with them. And another big problem that I had with this scene was that at the end, what we see is, um, let, me, let me get to their meeting first. Okay, so he's showing her some stuff that he has. The first thing looks almost like a computer hard drive, which if, you know, the prologue of season one, episode eight, was that everything at one point was far more futuristic. We had, you know, flying jets over her head, and I hope laser pistols. That would be amazing if Rand or somebody found a laser pistol. Actually, give it to Matt. That would be hilarious. But anyway, okay. So he's showing her this stuff. She's looking at it going, oh, this is before the breaking. Yeah. And then he shows her a piece of Quendiar, a broken chunk of Quendiar, and says, oh yeah, we found this. It was a part of something. Um, it was a moon dial and it was all broken and she's looking at it and sees that there was something written on it before and she's like oh it has writing on it. he's like yeah there was a poem written on the whole thing and i have a copy of it and he pulls out the copy and wants to sell that to her too and he wants to sell it for five marks and she's like Psh, that's a ripoff and he's like okay fine one mark what he he doesn't know how to haggle one mark? Okay. I mean, usually you'd be like, he'd come back at, you know, I'll give it to you for four or three. And she would have to go, you know, well, no, how about two? And then he'd have to settle, you know, but seriously, okay. One mark. And he's like, sure thing. Okay. As long as, you know, I'm not going to give you any deal on the broken piece of Quendiar. And then she gives him one mark for the poem and says, this is all I want. Good day. Take off now. Whatever, I'll do what I want. That to me was the way especially that she again expresses what appears to be glee at having taken advantage of him and screwed him over in this way. I mean, the impression we get is that it was not his choice to do to come to her and it was a difficult journey. I mean, I don't think that they're anywhere near the ocean, are they? Either way, he had to travel far to get to her and then for her to just pay him one mark. Okay, like that is a... That's a really horrible, spiteful thing to do to somebody and then to express glee over it. Doman then says something to the effect of, oh, I guess I deserved that. And he's like, okay with it. Mrs. Brown, I want you to spank me again. And I did not see a single thing that he did that indicated that he deserved that. And Moraine said, you know, be careful the next time that you insult an Aes Sedai, but I didn't see him insulting an Aes Sedai. So when did that happen? Something must have been left out here is all I can say. And if I was editing this scene, I would have told him, you need to cut that bit because first of all, it's not believable that he wouldn't be upset. And secondly, if he's going to say, oh, I guess I deserve that, we need some sort of an indication that their relationship is the way that it is because she in, or he insulted her in some way. They have a past where he did wrong to her and maybe he feels like he sort of owed her, in which case then the threat to come maybe wouldn't have been necessary, you know, like she didn't have to threaten him. But anyway... Time to move on from this. Uh, essentially, we come away from this scene where he says that, yeah, there's um, two people in hooded cloaks. I couldn't see who they are. And she gives him 10 marks to get out of town. She's like, oh my gosh, you know, you're in danger. Here's 10 marks, you get out of here. And he's like, what the hell have you gotten me into? I mean, gosh, this poor guy, she just ruined his life. <laughs> This does not make Moraine look good at all. But the 10 marks that she gives him does not, I think, save what she just did to him because she's ruined his life. I guess his life is only worth 10 marks. Okay. Move along. Move along. Then what we have is a scene with Lan and Thomas, or Thomas. And this to me is the most pointless scene in this episode. I probably, after watching the whole thing, would have said, I think you should cut this. I, I get it. They probably felt like they needed a beat with Lan, but this did not feel very effective. So Lan, first of all, seems to be explaining what the bond is to a fellow warder. I knew all this stuff already, so... I just don't believe that this warder needs this explanation. Maybe it's just to remind the audience, okay, but I mean, this is season two. Most people will have watched season one and don't really need this reminder, but whatever, okay. So I get the point of this needed to be a beat, but to me, this scene shows me 
that they didn't know what to do with this scene because typically you would have the younger warder talking to the older warder to try to get advice. And Thomas is anything but helpful in this scene. Lan reveals that I can tell she's trying to push me away, you know, I, and I don't know what to do. And Thomas is like, well, you could leave if you want to. And Lan is like, well, but you know, she, she needs me. And so, you know, I need to be here for her and Aes Sedai needs her warder. And he goes, well, she could always just use me if she needs me. You're very helpful, aren't you? You try to help everybody. To. Do you want to play another game? It was just a bit awkward to me that Thomas didn't seem to have any advice for Lan that would have been helpful in him deciding what to do. And instead, it's almost like he said, nobody can help you. It's your choice. And that's fine. But in the end, maybe Thomas should have said that because that other than that, this just seems like wouldn't Lan have been like, why aren't you like giving me your opinion on anything? Like what what would you do if you were in my situation? But he doesn't ask that. And instead, Thomas is just like, you can do whatever you want. You can't help anybody. I don't need your help. Nobody needs your help. Nobody wants it. It probably would have been better if Thomas ended it with saying, I want to tell you what I think you should do, but it's different for every person. And so I'm trying not to give you my opinion to sway what your choice is going to be. That would have been nice. That would have shown some wisdom on the part of Thomas, Thomas or whatever. Instead, all you get is very unhelpful comments. Yeah, and at the end of it, you get Thomas saying, you're a very stubborn person, almost as stubborn as Moraine. Thank you, doctor. Take two of these and call me in the morning. And Lan says, almost, as if indicating that he's like, she, if she keeps this up, I'm out of here. But then again, he had already stated that he is going to stay. He's not going to leave. So they're just showcasing Lan's indecisiveness about whether he's going to stay or go. And the rest of this conversation sort of felt like it was a bit of a waste. It would have been nice if they could have integrated this into maybe another conversation. Maybe when he was sitting down with the other two Aes Sedai and Thomas, compress this into here, but they didn't. So it wasn't a terrible scene, but it probably was the most wasteful scene, I think. Actually, there's one more, but it's in a different storyline that we'll get to later. So next, Lan goes up to Moraine after she's dismissed Doman, and is trying to get her to open up to him about what is going on. And she's again, just brushing him off, like not even in a kind way, just literally just ignoring him. And then when he flat out asks her like, why was that guy here? And she goes, is an Aes Sedai not allowed her secrets? This is somebody who is vindictive. The portrayal is that this is someone who is vindictive, who is trying to be like, it's no big deal. You don't have to worry about it. But, you know, you can see the vindictiveness in there. It's like she's an amateur at this. And if she was really good at manipulating people, as she's portrayed in the book, she would be doing the things that she's doing in the book, which is maintaining an amicable relationship. And even if she tried to do this to Lan, it should be very convincing to the audience even though we saw what happened with her and Doman, it should be convincing to us within the, the scope of this scene with Lan alone that she really is, it's not really a big deal. Like, you know, oh, we're just playing around. Like, you know, it's just our little back and forth that we have, you know, I, I have my secrets. But she didn't look that way. This was, I think, the fault of the director not telling the actress, you, you didn't portray a genuine playfulness here. You portrayed a gleeful control thing and not good. Not good for the character of Moraine. So I totally empathized with the land character getting upset about this. Don't smile at me. Shut me up. Don't try to drive me away. Don't you dare smile at me as if everything is fine. As if you don't know exactly what you're doing. And then this brings about my second problem with this scene. And that is that Lan up until this point in the show has already expressed himself publicly with passion and hurt and pain. We've seen it. We saw it at the Steppen episode. Because of what he did in the show in season one, this moment in season two is not as impactful. I mean, imagine if we had perfect stoicism from Lan up until this moment, and then he's like on the brink of losing it. I think it would mean a lot more. But since that's not what we saw, that's not what we feel when we see him at this point. 
Anyway, Lan kind of looks over at Moraine like he's surprised he had this outburst, not 100% sure why, but he's surprised at it. And you would, you, you kind of get, I actually think that the actor did do a good job in this case of looking to her like, I regret that I had to go that far, but surely now you can see how this is affecting me and it will change how you address me. But it has zero effect on Moraine at all. She literally just dismisses him and says, I'll have my dinner up here, slave. It's basically what she says. And he's finally like, I, you know, make your dinner yourself and eat it where you want. I don't care and he walks out. Good for her. And I think somebody in the comments said that this was like a test, like Moraine was testing Lan. But later on in the episode, we see that, why would she push Lan away when she needs the protection of a warder the most? Doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, he was willing to die for her already anyway. And that was the understanding between the two of them, that he will die before she does. So if she's doing this to push him away to protect him, Makes no sense. Anyway, after Lan leaves, she looks completely unaffected by any of this, keeps reading the poem that she has, and then she gets like this look of dread on her face before we cut. Then we get to the conversation that I thought we should have had Lan's discussion with Thomas, or at least the what I think was supposed to be the point of that discussion, which was to showcase that Lan is indecisive about what to do. It should have happened here. So we're at dinner out on the patio with Varen and Adelaide and Thomas. Looks like it's time for another therapy session. And we see that Lan, despite what he just said, he has made a plate of food for Moraine and he sets it out almost reverently, like for her spot at the table. I mean, gosh, they're portraying him as being like, you know, I'm putting my anger aside and I'm gonna continue as we have. I'm still your faithful warder. This woman does not deserve you. If I were her, I would have intercourse with you as often as I could. And then he has, he asks everybody at the table, to, you know, please wait for more rain. And none of them are convinced that she's going to come down. <laughs> and I like that Adelais is like, uh, I'm already eating. So <laughs> then we get a discussion at the table where essentially Adelais reveals that she just talks out of her ass all the time. <laughs> but she says that, you know, oh, Lan, you're just taking this entirely too personally. Like, I don't take it personally at all. Like, I'm unaffected by Moraine's behavior 100%. Like, it doesn't bother me. I mean, later we see that this lady is an Aes Sedai, or at least a channeler, and she's been around her sister, at least I think it's her sister, Varen and Thomas long enough that she should have a pretty good understanding of what the bond is and what it does. And I'm so glad that Varen and Thomas kind of eye roll Adelaide when she's talking like this. But it did seem like the writers weren't really considering that this woman has probably had a long history with being around warders and Aes Sedai and understanding what the bond is. So for her to say this, it just made her look kind of dumb. But that's okay, you can have dumb people. I mean, I'm okay with her being kind of dumb. <laughs> she kind of seems like she'd be a good time. I wouldn't mind hanging out with Adelaide. Of course, I wouldn't want it to be the end of the world, but if we're gonna sit around and watch a bunch of warders practice sword fighting, then I'm game to hang out with her. <laughs> Hey, real quick, just want to cut in here and tell you about a podcast that I was on recently, Millennial Classics with Q and Buri. We discussed Legally Blonde, which is a millennial classic. And if you haven't seen it, why haven't you seen it? It is so fun. We also took a bit of time to compare it to the Barbie movie, which I think is supposed to be this generation's Legally Blonde. It was a really interesting discussion and it was super fun. You can see the video that I was in with him up there in the upper right hand corner, but make sure to go and check out some of his other videos too. Okay, let's get back to the show. But then Varen and Thomas kind of explain what it is when a woman is cut off from the one power. And now I do have some confusion here and I wish that the show would explain what this is. But for me, okay, Lan, when he is, when the bond is masked for Lan, is that the same as being cut off? I mean, does he feel the same thing as being cut off? I don't know. And it seems like the show is sort of trying to hint that that's not what happens, like Lan, <sighs> okay, I don't know exactly how to explain this, but basically I'm not sure what the difference is between your Aes Sedai being killed and being masked, and then being masked and having your Aes Sedai cut off from the One Power. I, it doesn't, I don't know what the differences are. Uh? But I do wish that the show would kind of clarify the differences and not do it in this like working around, we're gonna kind of explain it halfway, but it's not gonna be like established because most of the time I'm sitting there going, why did Lan not know 
that Moraine was cut off from the One Power. Is there a difference between being masked and not being in a bond at all? Like, is that it? Does he feel like he's no longer in a bond? Is that how, it, I mean, it's just a little unclear. I would have told the writer of the show, at some point you need to explain this and it should be really soon because otherwise your audience is gonna be asking these questions and it's not gonna feel satisfying to watch the show because they're trying to figure out what's going on with Lan. Then we get Varen and Thomas explaining to Lan what it is for an Aes Sedai to be cut off. Well, actually it's just Varen explaining this. And so we're gonna have to put aside the, the idea that Lan has no idea what it's like for an Aes Sedai to be stilled or cut off or whatever or that he has been affected in any way by this. Like, I guess the bond being masked is the same thing as your Aes Sedai being cut off from the One Power. I think that's what the show is trying to say. And I don't know if that means that he feels like the bond doesn't exist anymore. I don't know. I do like what Varen explains here. I'm not sure I like it the way that it's explained, or not even the way that it's explained, but the way it was demonstrated in the show. So Varen says that being cut off from the One Power is the most brutal, fo brutal form of assault. And you, f you feel like you're experiencing that assault over and over and over again all day. Like it's a constant feeling of I'm under attack. And this is great because we can relate that in real life to certain events. Like if anybody has been abused or physically attacked in any kind of way, you kind of relive that. It's a, like post-traumatic stress disorder. You, you feel that. And the process of getting out of bed and putting one foot in front of the other is difficult. It is like, that is hard to do. That is like extreme survival at that point. And that is what Varen is saying is that I don't see a selfish woman when I look at Moraine. I see a woman, I see strength, more strength than any of us could ever muster. I'm not sure I like that we only saw Moraine doing this filling up the buckets and filling up the, the tub, and it was a massive tub for some reason. Maybe see her do this a couple of times so we see that this really is a coping technique for her. Um, as in, we don't see her going up and down the mountain a couple of times, but we see a couple of days where she does this and like this is her obsession. Maybe even have Lan watching her doing this, but maybe he tries to go over and talk to her and she's like, I'll, I'll get to that when I, you know, we'll talk after I do this or something, you know, like she's focused on the task at hand. That would have been a little bit better. Also would have wasted a lot of time, but you can, there are things you can do to make it not so like it takes up so much time. The other thing I didn't like about this is that we didn't see from Moraine's perspective that there was any awareness of just how cruel she is being to the people around her. And again, that sort of makes her look very immature, like she's sulking and she's taking out her frustration on the person who cares about her the most. Teenagers do this sort of thing, not full-grown adult women who have been through trauma in their life. Then we've got Thomas explaining to Lan that the bond isn't the only way that you communicate with Moraine. As if I didn't already know. The 20 years that you two had together is its own language. Like maybe you need to stop trying to get her to talk and instead just listen. Look at me, son. It's your fault. This didn't seem like the right advice. And you know how before I was saying, oh, in the garden, he wasn't giving him any advice. I really have to think about this one a lot more to see why does Lan need to stop and listen It's your fault. when Moraine is pushing him away. I mean, he can't even be there to listen to her because she's sending him out of the room. So it's still not very helpful advice. I would have liked to have seen that something that Thomas or Varen said in this instance changed things for Moraine and Lan going forward but it doesn't. Nothing that comes from this conversation helps from the Moraine side. For Lan, it basically gets him to go, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna bring her food to her. You know, you're right, I'm gonna try and listen and be there for her anyway, and I'll wait for her to talk to me. He brings her food up to her, but she's gone. <laughs> Jeez Louise, can't I do anything right? So next we see that Moraine has ridden off by herself and I do not know why she has ridden off by herself. Whatever, I'll do what I want. If it was to make sure that the sh the the fades, because she figured out that the two guys that were following Doman, because Doman was like, I can tell that you've got people on me, you know, following me. And she's like, your enemies are your own, not my problem. Like, which, gosh, another horrible thing to say, <laughs> but, um. She figured out that they are fades. And so she saddles her horse and leaves at night. Not smart. But if she's doing it to lead the fades away, 
so that they won't attack Lan and those guys. I guess she feels like whatever information that she has from this poem is not very important because if her priority is to save Lan and everybody else, what she does makes sense, dry, riding off by herself to lead the fades away. But you get the sense that whatever was on that poem is extremely important and she needs to get that information to somebody who can help or she has something that she needs to do with that. So her leaving without any protection makes no sense at all. It makes her kind of stupid. What I think would have been really great here is if Lan comes upstairs to find her and sees she's packing up and then she has a moment of like, okay, I need your help. Like we gotta go right now and we gotta, because there are fades on the way and then they go ride off. But that's not what happens. See, this would have been good because then we see that the change in Moraine has happened, that Lan's efforts got some sort of reward. Instead, they get no reward. He goes upstairs, she's not there, she's gone. Okay, so she rides off and I do have to break down and comment on this scene. She gets attacked by a fade and runs away to hide amongst some boulders. You can't outrun a fade. Hold my beer. <laughs> Very fast. I'm like Forrest Gump. Except I am not an idiot. That doesn't make much sense to me. Anyway, here's the next bit that I don't like. All right, we're gonna take a pause for a second and I wanna bring all of you guys on this journey that I went on as I tried to figure out what the hell was going on in this next scene. I watched this the first time on a big screen TV and had no clue. So I brought in my sister and brother-in-law and asked them to watch it with me and we watched it two more times on this big screen and we still came to the same conclusion, all three of us. From what we saw, it plays out like this. Moraine is running away from the fade that somehow she can outrun it and heads towards this cluster of boulders. As she approaches the boulders, she turns around and sees the fade coming down the way towards the boulders. And she's backing up, keeping her eyes on it. And then for some reason, she stops looking in the direction of the fade and starts looking around wildly like, where did it go? And we're all thinking, well, why didn't you keep your eyes on it? Now we couldn't see the fade because the camera was in such a position that when Moraine decides to break eye lock with it, we can't see it. It's not in the shot. So we don't know why she decided to break eye lock with it. It looks literally like she saw it coming down the way and then suddenly decided to stop looking at it and wondered, how come it's not in front of my eyeballs anymore? All right, then she takes out her knife, good, and as she's looking to her left, she sees a fade in the moonlight back up into a shadow. And then so she backs up to the boulder that she's closest to. Was this the same fade? It just continued down the moonlit lane? I don't know, I think so, because that was the last time we saw it. It was in the moonlight already, just strolling down the lane. And here it is again, out in the moonlight still, and then it backs into that shadow. Now this first fade was about 40 or 50 feet away from her, nice. But she broke her eye lock with it again as she backed up to kind of get out of its line of sight. Then she peers out to see if it's still over in the shadows and she can't see it. So, okay, she hides again and she starts looking around to her right. And just as she's looking to her right, either the same fade or another fade pops out on the right. Again, she breaks her eye lock and sort of scooches towards her left. Then she smooths the gravel underneath her right foot and we all agree, why would you make so much noise in perfect dead silence? I mean, that second fade or the other fade that was to your right, whatever, the one to the right, that was only about 30 feet away and it definitely could hear this, but whatever, okay. So she's doing this, I guess, to spring up and have a nice firm level piece of ground that she can spring up off of from her right foot, which means she's gonna spring to her left, okay? Is she gonna go after the one that was in, you know, 40 feet away? I mean, that's awfully far, but okay. Then suddenly she springs up, does a twist and skewers a fade that was directly behind her to her left. And that makes absolutely no sense. So after watching it twice like this on the big screen and all of us coming to the same conclusion that, yep, that's the way that it played out, we moved the footage over to my computer and watched it in Adobe Premiere with the brightness turned up another 33%. But it still felt wrong, and I'm gonna explain why. So first of all, I think it's directed poorly. I think that we should have been able to see the fade as Moraine was watching it the first time when it's coming down the lane. And when she decides to break eye contact, we should have seen 
that it was not just continuing to stroll down the lane and she decided to stop looking at it. We should see that maybe it slipped into a shadow and disappeared and that's why she's like, oh no, where did it go? That makes a lot more sense. But because they didn't show this on camera, my sister and brother-in-law, who have been watching the show but not reading the books, they're like, what the hell was going on? They didn't understand that the Fades can teleport, basically, through shadows, because the show has never explained this. And even if the show doesn't want to explain it, you need to infer it, or at least make it clear that this is what's going on, so that that way people who are watching this scene, seeing this piece of magic at work, Fades being able to travel through shadows, and then they can enjoy the scene rather than going, wait a minute, this makes no sense. Like, wait, what's going on? I have no clue what's happening. That's not a fun or enjoyable experience. It's not even a thrilling experience like you would experience in a horror because it makes zero sense at all. It makes just as much sense as that spooky room with the face that pops out at you after staring at the spooky empty room for 10 minutes. <laughs> then when we get to the fade that sticks its head out of the rock to her right, this is what they should have done. They should have had it stick its head out and then retract it and disappear again. But that's not what happened. What they decided to use instead was an auditory cue. An auditory cue that was not something that we picked up on until the fourth time watching this. And it was because I had my speakers on blast so we could really hear everything. But so she breaks eye lock with it and backs up into the shadow and you hear a sound to the left, a sort of whooshing sound, followed by a sound to the right, another whooshing sound. So this tells me that she believes it has disappeared from her right and reappeared to her left. Now, this would be fine if this wasn't the very first time that we saw this happen. I think we should have heard it as it was first coming down the lane and then it whooshes into a shadow and she goes, oh no, where did it go? And then when she's looking around for it again, she hears that sound to her left and that's when she sees it. And then she hears the sound again to her left and that's it disappearing again. Then when we see this, we hear the whooshing sound and it's to her right. And then we see the, it disappear and there's a whooshing sound. We go, okay, we get it. And then she has heard it appear to her left. I thought that she was gonna try and spring on the shadow that was 40 feet away, the one that the fade disappeared into the first time. But no, that's not what happens at all. What she does is she circumnavigates the boulder that she's got her back to, and she goes at least 90 degrees around it. I would say probably closer to 120, 130 degrees all the way around. I mean, she gets to the other side of it. And this is where the editing is poor because it's edited to be so fast that it literally looks like she she springs straight up and twists around to skewer a fade that is directly to her rear, as in like her back should have been touching the fade before she twisted around and got it. This might have been fixed one of two ways, either an overhead shot where we could see that Moraine is on one side of this boulder and the fade is to the other side. And the second option would be to have sort of a sliding motion where we've got the camera sliding in the right direction towards the right, showing here's Moraine on this side and there's a shadow on the other side. And we can see that Moraine is kind of aware of what's on the other side of this boulder. Like, you know, how sort of you, you put your back against a wall, but you're at the edge of the wall so you know that there's somebody on the other side of it. Then they should have had an insert of her taking at least one more step in order to get into position so that she could skewer this thing. Because if you look at it, not only did she circumnavigate this boulder, but she got to the far right side of the fade as she skewered it. So she traveled further than she needed to in order to skewer it. But yeah, this was poor directing and poor editing. You shouldn't have to watch it so many times to understand what's happening. And if you're gonna wait until now to reveal what this power is with the fades, being able to move through shadows, you need to spell it out a little bit more clearly. And there are ways to do it in this one moment, but they obviously didn't take the time to do that or didn't think that it was needed because maybe they assumed that everybody who was watching would have read the books, but that just means that you're doing an inadequate job telling the story. That took forever to sort out. She manages to kill one of the fades with her dagger. Great. But she should have remembered from her conversation with Master Doman that there were two of them. Two men in black cloaks on horseback. Right? Because she starts backing away like, oh, thank goodness I beat that guy. And what happens? She backs right into another fade. I mean, I guess maybe she is stupid, but she backs into another fade that slices her across the stomach and is about to execute her, taking its sweet ass time, lifting its blade up and it's gonna stab her. And then da, 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 to the rescue, Lan comes jumping in. 
I'm not going to critique this fight scene too much because I have been warned not to critique the fight scenes too much by my family. Although I really want to tear apart whoever choreographed these fight scenes for Lan. I mean, it was edited right. You couldn't really see what he was doing because the cuts were too quick and moved around and they were up too close. I just get the impression that this guy does not have much martial arts training. But I mean, it's okay. The cutting, I guess, made it work. I just love a good fight scene. I wanna see what they're doing and I wanna see that they do it well. But yeah, so Lan gets his butt handed to him and he suddenly realizes after getting slashed several times, including I think on the back of one of his legs so he can't even use it, he's out, he's down and out, out and down for the count, whatever, he's done. And you see the panic on his face. I have to hand it to the actor in this case. I wasn't super impressed with his performance in season one. I mean, I was impressed with his other features, but his performance was not one that stood out to me. This, I'm seeing some subtle facial expressions that are doing the job. And here was yet another one. I felt like you saw panic on his face that I'm going to die. And he looks at Moraine like the panic isn't about himself dying. It's about if I die, she's dead too. I felt like that was very well conveyed. And he looks at Moraine and Moraine kind of recognizes that this is it, we're dead. And she closes her eyes, lowers her head, and you get the sense she's trying to channel, even though she has tried before, I'm sure, and can't, you see swirls of light appear and she's like, what the hell is going on? And then it's revealed that Adelaide and Varen have arrived and they are attacking the Fades now. And I wish I could see clearly what they were doing exactly. At one point, Varen says, cover your ears, which I liked. And you could hear like this high pitch sound, but I guess Thomas didn't need to cover his ears. I'm not sure. Either way, Thomas comes in and I think I think it's Adelaide who's creating like a flaming sword. I wasn't clear on who it is. He's got a flaming sword and he's killing the um, the last remaining, whatever it is, Fade. And that's the end of that. Okay, so they've been saved by Varen and Adelaide and Thomas. And Moraine, in her relief, this was a scene that I think that the cinematographer and director should have reshot because it was from the wrong angle. I didn't even notice this until the second time I watched this episode. But Moraine's arm falls down on top of Lan's arm. And once she realizes her arm is touching his, she tries to pull away and he grabs her and stops her from pulling away and says, what aren't you telling me? The camera angle did not make it clear that's what was going on. And I felt like that was a really nice little moment. I wish that they had shot it from a different angle so that we could actually see Lan has grabbed her so she can't pull away again. But that's all we got for these characters in this episode. Final thoughts on all of them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't really like Moraine so far. Whatever, okay. That's all I got. Okay, now we're gonna look at Perrin's story because I wanna save Nynaeve and Egwene for the end. We start out with Perrin writing a letter and our very first instance of the show asking us to forget something huge that happened in season one. Loyal is alive! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm 99% sure he was dead in the end of season one because he was stabbed with the knife of Shatter Lagoth by Pat and Fane, and then Pat and Fane and Perrin sat there and had a little chat over his dead body for a few minutes. I mean, if Loyal was still alive, maybe we should have gotten a shot of him still breathing. But what I think happened here is that the writers were like, ah, you know what? We tried to kill off Loyal, but you know what? He is an important character and he does bring some variety to our cast. So we let's just pretend he didn't die. He just got stabbed. Okay. He just got stabbed and didn't breathe for the entire time that Perrin and Pat and Fane were chatting. Okay. And we see that they are on the hunt for the horn, which in the book, Rand and Perrin and Matt are all on this hunt. Oh, and so is Loyal. They're all on this hunt together. So this is a big change because Rand's not there and Matt's not there. So I don't know. I mean, the hunt for the great, the great hunt is all from the perspective of Rand, basically. We're not in the other boys' heads. So this is gonna be interesting. Anyway, then Royale reveals that Ingtar is also alive. <laughs> Now, Ingtar was most definitely dead at the end of season one. He was dead with blood splashed on his face and his eyes open dead. You know, that kind of dead, the dead that can't even close your eyes. That's how dead he was. 
<laughs> He's dead, all right. <laughs> I mean, you can't get much deader than me. A dead thing. He is right now, unless, of course, we killed him again. I suppose... The only one in this group who I'm not sure if he was dead is Uno, and I mean, there was a couple of other guys in the room here, and I don't recall there being that many men who were digging up the horn, and Uno was one of them. So, I mean, where was Uno at the end of season one? Was he like, holy crap, we're toast, I'm out of here, and he ran like he's a coward, like he just left the other men to get killed? Doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense down here. I like this guy. He's like some sort of a weird one-eyed Viking for some reason, that's what he is in my head, but. Anyway, so Ingtar is alive. It's not the same actor in this, so for a minute I thought that it was a different person, but no, this is supposed to be Ingtar. That's fine. I actually have no problem with recasting somebody. I wouldn't have a problem with recasting a character in the middle of an episode as long as you don't screw up the writing. It is better to recast a character than to alter a story because we can forgive weird visual things. What we cannot forgive are stories that don't make any sense. And that's what happened in season one. That's what happened in season one. I know a lot of people have said, oh, but there was, you know, COVID and everybody couldn't show up. Amazon is one of the biggest corporate empires in the world. If you think that they couldn't have pulled off waiting until they could recast somebody or even just recast somebody really quickly and continue shooting or just wait until the freaking pandemic is over and then do it this way, you're kidding yourself. They invested all this money in this show and then gave the excuse of, oh, well, COVID screwed up our writing for the last two episodes. I'm sorry, but the writing was screwed up from the first five minutes of episode one when we saw that they were changing the magic system. And from there, there were a lot more things before we even got to the last two episodes that just proved that the writing was just not very good. But anyway, so they have asked us to forget about season one and all the people that died because they're here they are alive. We're on the hunt. And the first thing that we get is they encounter Elias, who was a missing character from season one. The problem is that Elias now seems to have replaced Huron, another character from The Great Hunt. Now, my understanding is that the character of Huron had a very specific magical ability, which was to they called him a sniffer. He could sense when murder had taken place or evil intent was active, was doing things. Like he could detect where it had been and where, you know, like the trail that it left, be that was left behind. If So if you've got Padden Fane and he's murdering people as he goes and he's just going off in this direction or zigzagging, a sniffer would be able to find all the places that they had been until they find that person. Now, Elias has the same power that Perrin has. And in book one, he is the mentor who kind of introduces what this wolf brother sense is to Perrin. He's got the golden eyes and he's got a, a wolf sense where he can like commune with the wolves actually telepathically and kind of read their thoughts and whatnot. But they have given, I believe that they have given Huron's power to Elias. I'm not entirely sure if that's what they have done. They still, they call Elias a sniffer. And I think that they're referring to his elevated sense of smell, which Perrin does have. He has an elevated sight and elevated sense of smell. Also wolves that can go out and sense things, you know, smell and hear and whatever things, they will tell him where these things are. Um, but these seem to be two different powers, the whole sensing evil intent and this wolf brother sense. But I don't know, maybe they seem to be mushing them together. Oh yeah, something I forgot to mention about this scene. When they first come across Elias, they complain to Elias that the signal fire that they think he's made will bring the dark friends right down on them. But isn't that basically exactly what they want? They're trying to track down Pad and Fane and the horn, but they can't catch them. It would be a blessing if these guys came right for them because then the hard part, finding where they are, would have been done for them. Anyway, I don't have a whole lot to say on the Perrin segment simply because there wasn't a whole lot to talk about. It was an awful lot of walking and talking, which is pretty much the same thing that he did with the Tuatha An. Except now he's doing it with the Shinaran soldiers, and I expect a lot more action. I am going to talk a lot more about this in my next review, or maybe the one after that. Whatever, whenever it becomes appropriate to discuss. Anyway, I will discuss. Anyway, I will discuss the Perrin. <laughs> I will go into a deeper discussion of the Perrin segments, but I'm gonna wait to do that further down the line. And then we get something that is, I believe, a third power. Uh, we didn't see this happen in the book, but we saw something very similar to this. So they come across a bunch of 
Tuatha on, and I'm so glad they're dead. <laughs> oh, God, yes, finally! Some freaking peace and quiet! I thought that was gonna drive me nuts! And Perrin is able to see the last moments of the Tuatha on. Like, he gets a vision of what happened to them. And as he's having this vision, we hear the wolf howl in his head. And we also get Elias basically confirming that he saw the same thing. He's had the same vision. So this power to see what has happened in the past and as, you know, see shadows of it in the, few, in the present, that was something that Rand had in this book. So are they taking a power that only the dragon is supposed to have and giving it to the wolf brothers? I'm not sure. And are they taking something that sniffers are supposed to have and giving it to the wolf brothers? I'm not sure. I really don't know. This seems like a very big break in the magic system again. I feel like they are giving the wolf brothers an added power, possibly two added powers, and I see big consequences for that in the future. I'm curious to see what they do with it though. Anyway, Perrin sees that Padden Fane was there and that um, all of these guys were killed by the bad guys. And they follow a little girl. Like in his vision, he sees a little girl got away and they go in the direction of where the little girl went. And I think this is the same little girl from the prologue. So this to me is just a hint. It probably would be harder to, to, to figure out from watching the show alone, but from the book, where we get the sense that other members of the Dark Friends who are at that meeting, they would try to kill each other if they knew who each other were. It makes sense if you've read that. I don't know if that was really portrayed well in the show, but they find the body of a Shinar and soldier who was killed and a dog that I guess had killed the Shinar and soldier and the little girl maybe got away. Um, but I kind of think that this little girl and that Shinar and Soldier, like the Shinar and Soldier came to kill the little girl's mom who was at this meeting because she was a Tuatha An and you got the impression her mother was a Tuatha An. So, okay, so that's what happened is one member of these dark friends killed another member of these dark friends, probably to steal their glory in some way. Anyway, that's what happened. And then they go to bury the dead. Like that's the plan. We're gonna stop and we're gonna bury the dead. And we get, Perrin doing something that really bothered me in the first season. So Perrin's entire growth, his growth arc was all in his head. Very little of it was related to his actions. We didn't see his, his emotional and psychological growth being tested by his choices in the physical world around him. He never had to like, what do I do? Do I save this person or not? The closest we got to it was when he was in the tent with the white cloaks and he did not kill child Valdar, Egwene did. Now, if he had killed child Valdar, and then later kind of regretted that he killed somebody or maybe looked back at that and like, I, I regret that I killed somebody, but didn't I kill somebody who was bad? That would have made his story more interesting, but he didn't do anything. So boring, okay? You gotta have your characters testing or being tested. Their vindictions need to be tested in order for us to feel that those vindictions are strong or that there's actual growth that's happening. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of walking and talking. He might as well be with the Tuatha on again. Wow. Devils, does their treachery know no bounds? This is great. This is just great. Now what am I supposed to do? Why don't you try walking it off? Except these are Shinar and soldiers. It should be so much more interesting. But then, yeah, he's talking to Inktar about like, you know, doesn't this make you angry? Don't you want revenge? And Inktar starts talking about how, you know, what good would anger do? Oh my God. I hope it's not too much for me to ask. Just for once, if you shut your freaking mouth. Perrin's basically pointing out that this was a fellow Shinaran who betrayed all of you guys and caused hundreds of deaths because of his betrayal. Don't you hate him? Wouldn't you want revenge? Wouldn't you want to just leave him out for the vultures? That kind of thing. And Ingtar starts talking about how if every, something like if every Shinaran along the borderlands wanted revenge, then, you know, we'd be dead, basically. There wouldn't be any Shinarans left, something along the lines. It just seems to me that we're setting a precedent yet again for Perrin that he isn't tested in the things that he is experiencing. He's, his growth, he seems to be trying to lean more towards I'm willing to do violence to protect. And now it's going towards 
maybe I shouldn't take revenge on other people. But the thing is, is we, we haven't seen much of him having opportunities to take revenge and then choosing not to. I mean, you can say, what about the thing with, with uh, Pad and Fane at the end of episode one? He did nothing. He picked up an axe and just stood there. We didn't see him try to go and get revenge. I mean, what if he tried to go and get revenge, but then Pad and Fane is like, we're not supposed to touch Perrin. The Dark One has said we ha we can't fight him, and they like don't even give him the opportunity to give to exact his revenge. That would have been better because we would have seen him trying to go and do something. I guess you could say that's sort of what happened in the White Cloak tent, and Egwene did the thing for him. Eh, okay, I'd have to think more about that one. Anyway, let's move on because I got to get through this. What Perrin essentially says is that he wants to take revenge on Pad and Fane, and the closer they get to him, the greater his anger is, and he, you know, he's afraid of what he might do. And that's when Ingtar says, you know, you should maybe ask Pad and Fane why he betrayed your wife and your village, because you might not like the answer, but I think you might find it worth asking the question. And like, okay, fine, but I don't know what the hell the answer could be that was that made it acceptable to like, oh yeah, I'm gonna kill everybody. Cause I'm sure Pad and Fane knew he was killing everybody. Then when we get to the end of Perrin's little thing here, he writes a letter to Egwene and Nynaeve. And in the letter, it says that he's feeling this camaraderie with the Shinarans that he really is liking. And he says, you know, it, when you're by yourself, there's a saying that the Shinarans have, and essentially what it says is that if you're by yourself with a shield, you can still, you know, you're exposed in a lot of other places, like only one side of you is protected. And he's like, but if you have a group of you and you all have your shields up to protect each other, then nothing can get you. You're all protected. And he says, that reminds me of us, of, you know, me and Matt and Egwene and Nynaeve and, you know, the whole gang. Like we were stronger together, but now we're all on our own and it feels weaker and he wants them all to get back together. I would have liked to have seen in this whole episode with Perrin that we saw that feeling of safety and camaraderie among the Shinarans, but we didn't really have anything demonstrating that. Like maybe they should have been attacked and we saw that Perrin realized he didn't have to look out for his own back because somebody else was always going to be there protecting him. And that would have made this letter, the stuff that he says in it, mean more. The other thing that we have Perrin doing at the end of this is we see him taking off his ring, which I believe is his wedding ring or whatever is the ring that was, you know, between him and his wife. And as it's bell time and he's going to send his little lantern raft off onto the water for his wife. And then we see another one is for Rand, I believe. He put, takes his ring off, puts it on the little raft thing, like he's going to send it off. But then he changes his mind and puts the ring back on, like he's not ready to let go of his wife. Now we did kind of see little hints about him thinking about his wife when we had him talking to Ingtar about, I just keep seeing my wife waving to Pad and Fane and I want revenge on Pad and Fane now because how could he do that to all of us who were so kind to him? But that wasn't enough. That wasn't about letting go of your wife. I would have liked to have seen him having maybe conversations about letting go of the past and how that's really the only way that you can go forward. And if you're so caught up in the past, you can't do good for people going forward. That would have been a much better sort of conversation to be having. Um, I don't know, or something. Just there, there should have been more going on here to make it seem like that's an important part of his story here. Instead, it feels like, okay, he's got problems with wanting revenge. He's got problems with feeling like he's not as protected in certain ways because he's not with Nynaeve and Egwene and all those guys. And we also see that he is struggling to let go of his wife so he can move on. None of those points seemed connected in this. And when you write a story, you want everything to kind of be feeding these main storylines and these main points of growth for your characters. Even if you have to have other things happening in the story, you find ways to connect them to those plot lines, those internal psychological growth kind of plot, plot lines. But anyway, we gotta move on because I'm t spending way too much time on that. Oh my gosh, Nynaeve and Egwene. Oh, this is so long. We start out with Egwene and she is out collecting slop water from various places in the White Tower. It's actually a good way for the audience to see what the White Tower is usually like. So we didn't see much of the White Tower in the first season, or we didn't see much of it like doing anything. It was like a room, one room and like the throne room. But through following Egwene, we get to see the operations of the White Tower. We've got the warders have their little practice area. We've got the kitchens. We've got the private bedrooms. We've got the 
walkways where random people can be passing by. One of the things that Egwene encounters while she is collecting slop water is she walks in on Alana having a threesome, you know, with her two warders. And Egwene is totally scandalized and quickly hauls ass out of there as fast as she can. Okay. Anyway, she's collecting slop water, brings it down to the kitchen, and we have a horrible conversation with Nynaeve. My gosh, I don't think that the writers like the Nynaeve character very much because, dang, they are, like, making her super unlikable. Nynaeve starts out by basically complaining that all they've done since they've been there is chores, like cleaning and whatnot. And Egwene is like, oh, well, you know, this is a, we gotta do this. Like, this is a rite of passage. It helps to build character. And Nynaeve says, I have enough character. Sure, okay, whatever, Nynaeve. I do like what they're doing with the Egwene character, although it doesn't necessarily make sense to who she's supposed to be as according to season one. But remember, we are forgetting everything that happened in season one. It didn't happen. So we have a brand new Egwene. And I like the new Egwene. She's much better than she was in season one, which was, uh, anyway, she's okay with all of this extra hard work and stuff, but then she does something that doesn't make any sense. So Alana walks into the kitchen and she's about to conduct a lesson and she's gonna teach us a little bit about the magic. And this is fine. This is how you introduce a magic system to an audience that has had no exposure to it. It's not the most natural flowing discussion, but this is how you do it. Alana explains the five different elements that they deal with. Water, earth, fire, air, and spirit. And she sets all of the novices to practicing a weave where they pull elements of earth and elements of water, weave it together, and then they pour the slop water through it and it will be filtered clean. And then they will have a glass of clean water which they can then drink. And she sets all of the, the novices to trying this out. When she gets to Egwene, Egwene is refusing to use her hands. And Alana is like, um, why don't you use your hands? Because you're not making anything happen. You're literally just standing here and making nothing happen because you're making it harder for yourself. And I do like that Egwene is like, I didn't come here for easy. But the thing is, is the show did not show us that she can do this with her hands. So instead it looks like she's, she's setting a handicap for herself that is preventing her from learning how to do this thing in the first place. And to me, that's just a waste of time. It would have been good if they showed that she can do this with her hands, but then she tries it without and she's trying it without. And I know that it would have been like, oh, but we wanna showcase that she's really trying to work hard. No, what we're showcasing here in this case, because you failed to show that at first, is that she is needlessly making something hard for her to do and she's stunting her own ability to learn because of it. Then Alana gets to Nynaeve who is not shown to be trying anything at all. Now, she's trying to say that she has tried before, but we haven't seen her try on screen. We haven't seen past instances where she's tried and we don't even see her trying here. She doesn't even close her eyes. Alana's like, close your eyes and try this, like, just try. And Nynaeve is like, I have tried before or whatever. And I'm sorry, but this is not an effective way to to demonstrate that she has tried. We should have seen her trying. We should have even heard her say, we've had the same conversation a million times. Every time I try, it doesn't work. I just don't want to do this anymore. But then I have a big problem with this anyway, because then Nynaeve, why the hell are you even here? I mean, why is she here? And I know that that's supposed to be like, oh, this is what we're going to figure out for this episode. But the thing is, is wh why didn't she just leave sooner? Like what? Why is she here not even trying anymore? I mean, if she was being forced to stay here, like she had no choice in the matter, she had to go to the White Tower to learn how to do this stuff, and then she was behaving this way, I would understand. But she's not expressing frustration with learning and ability in a way that, to me, makes me believe that she's really frustrated with the process of learning because we haven't seen her actually trying. The show failed in showing us that she actually tries. And so she just looks kind of sulky and pouty and kind of mean. Is he friendly? Mm. <laughs> they almost got me that time, didn't he? What the show basically showed us is somebody who isn't going to try. Everybody's being very nice to her. Alana couldn't be kinder trying to, to encourage her. She even puts down Egwene in front of Nynaeve to let, you know, 
And that I have a problem with. I'm sorry, but Alana is a stupid teacher. Unless they are literally trying to pit their Aes Sedai against each other, which seems like a really not productive way to teach your students. She tells Egwene, you are incredibly powerful because of, you know, Amalisa was able to take out a whole Trolloc army because of your guys' power, not her own, because of you guys. She's like, you are so powerful. But then she goes, but you're nothing compared to Nynaeve. Nynaeve is amazing. Like you seriously are nothing. You suck. <laughs> She basically says that. I mean, trying to instill conflict between these two women. I mean, that's what it looks like anyway. You can say all you want that, well, that's not, that's not what she was trying to do. It just inadvertently happened. Okay, so Alana is an incompetent, inexperienced teacher because that's what I saw. But yeah, so Nynaeve is just terrible to Alana who's trying to be nice to her. Good old kitty cat. Nice, nice kitty cat. And then when Alana is like, look, I need you to try. Like you've been here for five months and you haven't, you haven't channeled. Like whatever block it is that you have, you gotta let it go now. Like she's not saying this in a like, you know, you need to stop this now. She's doing it in a kind, in a, sort of a, an encouraging way as demonstrated by her complimenting her on her ability to pa have power. And then, oh my gosh, and Eve, I forgot. She says, nobody should have that kind of power. So she has power, but she doesn't want to have it. So why is she here? Oh, let it go. Okay. So Alana leaves it at none of you are leaving without drinking your cup of water. And so Nynaeve drinks the slop water straight without even trying to filter it. That is disgusting. Disgusting. This would have been effective if we had an abusive teacher and this was like, we're gonna watch somebody who's stubborn and doesn't want to do things the way that the abusive teacher wants her to do, wants to do it a different way, says, fine, I'm not doing it your way. I'll just drink the slop water and go, something like that. Instead, we had somebody who was being stubborn and spiteful almost against herself. <laughs> Face to foot style, how'd you like it? Anyway, this is just such a bizarre thing. It's like, she, she doesn't want to be there. She doesn't want the power that she has. And yet here she is still there. And then she spites herself by drinking the slop water. Ugh. That is literally spit water. She is drinking other people's spit. Ugh. Don't go kissing land with that mouth. Then we have a meeting in the garden between the senior Aes Sedai, or the ones who are supposed to be trying to teach Nynaeve, and the mistress of novices, who is played by that woman from Hunt for the Wilder People that I love. Uh, you can call me Bella or Auntie if you like, even though I'm not the real Auntie. What you want to do? You hungry? That's a silly question, isn't it? Look at you. <laughs> Here you go, you have a go. I don't know what her other acting experience is, but I enjoyed what she did with the character in that movie. That's dinner sorted. Whoa, wanna help me gut it? Anyway, we get introduced to a lot of backstory in a way that I think works. I mean, they did repeat quite a bit of information that we got in the first scene with Nynaeve and Egwene and Alana, all of them. You didn't need to t repeat all of that. We get it, Egwene needs to relax and Nynaeve is blocked by something that she needs to let go of. But then we do have a good introduction to something new and this is a good way to do this. So Leandrin is like, maybe they need a more effective teacher. Like maybe I could go in there and do something about this. And we find out that Leandrin is not allowed to teach novices because a novice actually died in her care. And Leandrin is like, well, using the one power is dangerous. That can happen sometimes. And she informs the audience through this discussion and through her presentation of her argument, like her reasons for why I should be allowed to teach Nynaeve. So this is effective. And it shows that she, she's become a much smarter person since season one. If you've got an ass, I'll kick it. Leandrin says, look, there's a lot of crazy ass stuff going on in the world. Like we have fewer channelers than ever before we ha the, that are being born and brought to the, the, the tower. The hunt for the horn of Valir called an Ilian Trolloc raids near Arafel and another false dragon has declared himself in Saldair. They say he's even more powerful than Loghain. But she says that something is coming, obviously, and we need to be ready for it. And here is Nynaeve, the most powerful channeler in a thousand years. She's like our strongest weapon against the Dark One. Why aren't we doing something different from her, for her, than we do with all the other novices? Like, we clearly have to approach this 
in a different way, which I think is obvious. Yes, you do. And she says, let me talk to her. Just let me talk to her. And the mistress of novices says basically, okay, yes, you can go and talk to her. This is gonna be good. Yeah, I'll have some of that. So I liked this scene because we saw that there was a, this is how things have been. And now the world is like this and what we're doing isn't working. We need to change something. And we see the shift. We see the problem and there's a solution that's put in front of us, but it's not necessarily a solution that we like because it's Leandrin who we know is up to something. She is clearly not a very good person. So the solution, which to the audience is like, yeah, we do need a different approach. None of the other ladies can come up with a solution, but Leandrin might be right, but it's Leandrin. So there's conflict in there. This is good setup. This is a good setup. I like this a lot. I don't necessarily like how it was done, but I mean, I mean, it's a way to do it. And I would have had less problems with this if I had fewer problems with the rest of the show, but anyway. And yeah, this scene created some urgency too, which I think we really needed at this point. I didn't like though how the mistress of novices dismisses them. Now get out of here, the lot of you. Didn't she call all these ladies here? I mean, was she having like a private conversation with Alana and then everybody else just like collected around them? You didn't see that happen. So when she says this, it just felt goofy. Like how mean? And could you imagine your boss calling you and all of your coworkers into a meeting and they say, now get out of here, all of you. And it was not said in a way that was like joking. <laughs> then we get Nynaeve sparring with Alana's two warders. Names? Black and Tan. First name? No first names. One of us is Black and one of us is Tan. We're modeling team. Perhaps you've heard of us. I mean, my gosh, the writers do not like her because she seems to be happy and excited when she seems to be winning and then angry and frustrated when she seems to be losing. And now you see this when somebody is learning how to fight in martial arts. So I, I teach fencing and this is normal, but it's like a frustration with yourself. Like I am struggling to do this thing that I want to do. It's almost like the people who wrote this don't understand that that's what's going on here. Because what we saw at the end of her little sparring with the guys was the guys clearly can handle her easily. They're just playing around having fun, but she's doing well, she's getting better, which I do not believe at all. I'm sorry, you'd have to be like a god or something in order to learn a martial art that could compete even remotely with guys who've been doing it for their life time. I mean, it's not believable, not believable at all. It's also not believable that a woman would be able to handle a big heavy sword against these guys. It's just not. But anyway, so the reason why I didn't like her frustration and why I had the feeling that it wasn't about her being frustrated with herself, it was had something to do with them, the men, is when the guys like beat her and whatever, she turns around to one of them and goes like, I almost had you. And I'm sorry, but she did not almost have them. They were going easy on her, but okay, whatever. I sure do hope that she's like part goddess or something. And that's why we should believe that in five months she learned all of this. I mean, seriously, if somebody came in and in five months was able to compete with two of the top warriors in the world, you'd be like, hold the phone. This person needs to be trained more thoroughly as a warrior because there's clearly something special going on here. Anyway, she has a conversation with the two warders. My name is Black. His name is Tan. I can't believe you just made that assumption. I did like, oh gosh, uh, this is the one thing that season two is doing with Nynaeve that I actually appreciate. And that is despite the fact that they are continuing to make her very unlikable, they are having other characters putting in her, her in her place or not bending to her. So she starts out about to diss Alana. Like, I know you love, you know, you're in love with Alana and everything, but she can be a real, and you know, she wasn't gonna say something nice, but the one warder, he says, Alana Sadai, to you. Do it again. Do it again! Do it again! <laughs> do, do it again! And Nynaeve immediately like, oh, well, I, she doesn't say it, but because of her shift in how she starts talking, she says, it's this whole place, really. It's not just Alana. It's everything here. That it's, you know, basically, it's frustrating her. It's almost like she became afraid of if she can't do what she was going to do. She can't be the bitch that she was planning to be. Okay, so good. 
She's starting to learn that you can't treat people like this. You can't start fights with people because there are some people who, if you start a fight with them, it's not gonna end well for you. But essentially the two warders explain to her that you need to find something like, what is your reason for being here? Why are you here? Which is kind of what I was asking myself before. So this is an appropriate conversation to have. It's a little surprising that they're having it five months down the road, but it would have been nice to have seen that there was something for a reason for her to be there at first. Now. I, I'm guessing they're telling us it should be the whole land thing before. Remember how she said, maybe I can go be an Aes Sedai and I'll be something other than a wisdom and then maybe I can get married. But then they left that conversation with her being convinced that Lan wasn't gonna be the one who marries her, or at least that's what the audience was supposed to be convinced of. So I really don't know what she's doing here. But then again, we're supposed to forget everything that happened in season one. Moving on, or we'll never get past this, uh, we get to Egwene going to talk to Alana. Now this is the only other scene that I thought was kind of a waste. Um, I actually like this, but I would have liked it more for Egwene from the book than Egwene in the show. So Egwene in the show is no maiden. She and Rand were banging and it wasn't a secret, like a private thing. Like if I could say, okay, maybe they were banging, but it was like culturally in the two rivers, it's something you, it's very private. They were banging in the lobby of the main inn where anybody could come in and find them. So it's not like a, this private thing. So I don't believe for a second that Egwene would walk in on a threesome and be like scandalized. So when she goes to talk to Alana and she's being very awkward about it, I was like, okay, I like this for book Egwene, but for show Egwene makes no sense. But again, we have to forget everything that happened in season one. There was no season one. This would be a scene where you would want to have something that Alana tells to Egwene is going to really help her going forward. And as earlier Alana stated, Egwene needs to relax. But what we get here is Egwene has come to ask Alana how to channel two things at once. Like it's too hard for her to, to conceptualize in her head. And Alana thinks that she's talking about how to bang two guys at the same time. And Alana's advice is basically like, well, you know, just relax. So that was relevant to her magic question. And then she says, focus on your own pleasure. <laughs> okay. My understanding is that being in the intimate moment with the person that you love, or in this case, two persons that you love, it's kind of a give and take. And if it's not, somebody is being abused. <laughs> So, okay. I sort of get the impression that it's the blonde guy because he said that he fell in love with a warder and then the black guy is saying, and I fell in love with an Aes Sedai. And then the blonde guy said, well, you always make me feel like the third wheel. <laughs> I kind of feel bad for this guy. Okay. But anyway, so this whole scene is about a misunderstanding about what they're talking about. And what I would like to have seen is that at the end of this scene, we get there and we realize that all the advice that Alana has given to Egwene, thinking that she was asking her about how to have a threesome, was somehow relevant and helpful to her, her question about the magic. And instead, when it's revealed that I was asking you about the lesson today, not about the threesome, Alana goes, oh, well, um, you're probably just trying to think of each individual grain of sand as opposed to just the element of earth as a whole, and that will simplify things for you. If she turned it into a technical thing, it would have been actually pretty good if she said, you know what, you actually need to do, the, the advice I gave you is kind of applicable here too. And I, I would have to sit there and hash out how I would rewrite this dialogue to make that work. But because that's not where it went, I felt like they were trying to have this comedic moment here. And honestly, I would have been more accepting of this if I didn't feel like we already had kind of a wasted scene earlier. So I'm very critical of these writers spending time on things that aren't important at this point and then not taking that time and using it to do something that could be more important, like giving Perrin some action to test his convictions. I am really glad that Egwene did not take that pomegranate because she walks in on Alana, who is just lounging on the floor with a pomegranate that she's eating. And I'd be like, lady, I don't know what the hell you were doing before I walked into this room. I don't want anything that you've been touching and I definitely don't want to eat it, so. Gross. Yeah, ew. 
One thing that they have done in the show is create a likable trait in Alana that I've seen across storytelling and it is effective. And I think I've nailed down why this is effective. So Alana, whenever you see her, is eating fruit and really enjoying it, maybe a little too much sometimes. But to have a character who enjoys eating insinuates a character who takes joy in a indulging in life. And there is something very attractive about this trait in a character or about a character who has this trait. So you see it in One Piece, Luffy loves to eat. And it's, again, it's like this, I enjoy eating. I enjoy something that is a part of giving life. And in Shadow and Bone, which is a series that I reviewed uh, earlier this year, Nina really loves eating, really enjoys it. And it doesn't matter if it's sweet or savory, she just really enjoys something delicious. So this can be a very effective way of creating a character that people watch and go, ah, I wish I could enjoy something that much. And it's something that we all kind of have access to. Unfortunately, most of us will like gain a ton of weight if we eat a bunch of fruit or tarts all the time, so. But it's something that we enjoy seeing, I believe, because it is an expression of enjoying something that is part of life, something that is life-giving. Also necessary to this trait, I think, is a recognition on the part of the character that this is a thing that gives them joy. Sort of like you know that this is something that gives you joy and you recognize that joy and appreciate it in some way. Next, we have my favorite scene in the episode so far, and that is Nynaeve in the kitchen trying to channel all by herself. I do like that this shows that she is trying to make a change. So. She had a conversation with some people and it caused her to want to behave differently. Sort of like what we saw with Lan. He had a conversation with the two Aes Sedai and he decided, all right, I'm going to continue making, you know, serving Moraine. Unfortunately, we didn't see any change in Moraine. But anyways, get back to Nynaeve. Then we get Leandrin comes in and we know what it's for. She's going to talk to her and try to help her to channel again. So perfect setup. She's trying to channel anyway. And I love that Leandrin is using her dark power in a way that we want to see. She is putting Nynaeve down and not putting up with her bullshit. Nynaeve is immediately disrespectful to her the moment that she walks in and Leandrin like water off a duck's back and begins to antagonize her immediately, saying like, you've been nothing but a disappointment. You've been here for five months. And she's like, and you're wasting your time with learning how to use a sword. And I, I just loved this bit here. This scene wasn't perfect, but I really enjoyed what I saw. And I think I could, I've narrowed it down to the fact that I enjoyed seeing that Nynaeve was giving the same shit that she does, that she has been since season one to a character, except this one didn't bend to her. This one didn't put up with it. Just like how we saw with the two warders earlier this is why this is an improvement from season one. So she's antagonizing her and telling her the you're learning the swords is a waste of time. Then Leander and says, you know, if a man came at me with the sword, I would meet him with a blade of my own. And she makes like a one power air sword. <gasps> and she says, you know, this is basically, she says, I would do this and I would fight him with this. But then she's like, but why would I even do that? She's like, it's a complete waste of my energy. She's like, I, I don't want a fair fight. I want to win. Like, I, I'm not here to engage in a fair fight. I have more power. I should use it. And she blasts Nynaeve against the wall. This! This! I want this! Now, which we did see in the Great Hunt, except it was actually the Amerlin seat who did it to her. But this is fine. I like what they're doing with 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 Leandrin. I'm not sure where it's going, but I, I I became more interested in Leandrin from this episode than I've ever been in any character up till now. Yeah, <laughs> at least in this series. Oh, that's a plot twist. But yeah, so she blasts Nynaeve, pins her against the wall, and then continues to antagonize her by telling her that warders are basically just a waste. What does she say? She says that they're a distraction, a weakness. She's like, we can protect ourselves and they're nothing more than glorified dogs. You know, they, they've, she basically says that they stroke our sister's egos. Like that's what they're there for. They just make you feel better, but really they're not that useful. We have the power and we don't need them, which the show has done until now. 
I mean, in the book, it was obvious why you need warders, but the show has decided you don't need warders. So she's making it obvious why you don't need them, right? And then she starts saying that warders are basically useless. They're worthless. And they usually end up like some sad footnote, you know, and the Aes Sedai who was bound to them because they die in some battle. Like the Aes Sedai don't even remember them because they live so much longer, I'm assuming. And this pisses off Nynaeve. And so she blasts Leandrin up against the wall. And I actually really loved the way the actress delivered this line. <laughs> like making it very clear that all of this was an act to antagonize Nynaeve into channeling. So she did it. She did the thing that nobody else in the White Tower seemed to be able to do, and that was get Nynaeve to the point that she can channel again. So Leandrin would be a great teacher for Nynaeve. That's my conclusion at the end of this. And I would actually really love to see their lessons together because Leandrin doesn't put up with Nynaeve's shit. And to prove that point, it happens right here. She's basically like, there it is, like, you're amazing. You only saw that weave once and you were able to copy it. And then Eve goes, if you don't let me go right this instant, and at that instant, Leandrin does, but she didn't let her go. She cut her off from the one power. This is what I want. I, I love it. It's like, cause, I mean, if you don't let me go this instant, what? What are you gonna do, Nynaeve? Like, you just did the one thing that you thought you could do. And I love that when Leandrin does stop at that, I was like, oh no, she gave in, but she didn't. I loved it. She cut her off from the one power. And this like affects Nynaeve even more. And Leandrin's like, there, you see, like I've cut you off from the one power. It's right there. You can feel it, but you can't touch it. Like, that's what I can do to you. Gosh, the lessons between the two of them are gonna be amazing. Like, I, this is what you want to see with a character like Nynaeve. You want to see her have a teacher who will be effective and won't put up with her bullshit and maybe help her grow as a human being. But yeah, she tells Nynaeve, like, my sisters would have you believe that there's only one way to channel, but there's not. Like, you've got anger, use that anger. And she says, I want you to become powerful, not, you know, silt and swords and whatever. I want you to be so powerful that no man or woman, not even me, could ever take that from you. So Leandrin has produced the counter argument to the argument that Nynaeve wasn't actually presenting to Leandrin, which was nobody should have this kind of power. Leandrin's basically saying, if you don't have this power and know how to use it to defend yourself, somebody who does have that power will make your life miserable or take everything from you, whatever. This is a very good, strong argument against Nynaeve's mentality. So I would see out of this going forward, this should be Nynaeve's new motivation. She doesn't want to be the vulnerable one going forward. It doesn't seem to be that with the next scene that we have with Nynaeve, but anyway, I loved this scene, thought it was great, and I'm like, all right, this is the most interesting plot line so far in this episode. This is what I want to see. I want to see Nynaeve and Leandrin. I want to see them fighting each other, but working to go forward. I think it would be super interesting. Whether that happens in the books or not, I'm just talking about the show. In the show, I want this. But yeah, so then in the next scene, it looks like Nynaeve is still kind of like, what is, you know, my, what is the thing that I want that's going to keep me here? You know, the conversation she had with the warders, what is the one thing that I'm going to hold on to that keeps me here? And at the end of this episode, it seems to be Egwene is it, which is actually what it is in the book. Like the whole reason she goes to the White Tower isn't because of this thing with Lan, it's because of Egwene. She doesn't want Egwene to be alone at the tower. But the show hasn't done the best job of portraying that or of conveying that meaning. And the attempt to do so in this next scene, I think, fails. And it's because of what I've called in the past camera tricks. But it's it's really just what the, the director chooses for the camera to look at. So Nynaeve goes in to find Egwene in her room. And Egwene is making a lantern for Beltine. And uh, Nynaeve has come to read the letter from Perrin. And it would have been nice if we're trying to convey that her reason for staying at the tower is going to be Egwene, which is the conclusion she seems to come to at the end of this episode, if we set that up in this scene, if we, or, or we, we emphasize it in this scene. But they didn't really do it. We should have seen Nynaeve outside of her room, outside of Egwene's room, looking in on Nynaeve and seeing that Nynaeve is in distress, that she is crying maybe while she's 
making her lantern. And it like, you can, the camera is looking at Nynaeve, recognizing how alone Egwene feels and she feels responsible for Egwene. So, you know, she knocks on the door so that Egwene has a moment to like put herself back together. And then like Nynaeve comes in like, hey, I got a letter from Perrin. And, you know, then they talk about how it's Beltine and they read the, the letter from Perrin and Perrin's like, I miss you guys, basically. The best thing about the military is all the cool stuff I'm seeing for the first time. Yeah, that's great. And he says, let's all get together in the future. Um, you know, that's what his letter says. So she's reading this to Egwene. So then what the show does is she's read the letter and then Egwene breaks down and starts crying about how she misses Rand so much, which is fine. But even when the show had this moment, it didn't, the camera didn't zoom in or cut in close on Nynaeve and have a facial expression on her face that is like recognizing how in distress Nynaeve is. We should have maybe seen even an over the shoulder of, you know, over Nynaeve's shoulder looking at Egwene. And we see that Egwene just feels so alone and she's crumbling under this pain, which I would have liked to seen more of this pain from Egwene earlier in the episode, but okay, whatever. But these little tricks, I mean, I would have, wouldn't have done all those things, but I would have done at least one of those things were not used. Instead, Egwene kind of has her breakdown and then Nynaeve goes, no matter how much I complain, I am never going to leave you. I'm going to be here for you. And because we didn't have those little moments where we see the recognition of what Egwene was going through and it wasn't emphasized, I mean, you could see the actress, it was a two shot. So that's where you see two people in the frame and you see the two of them either looking at each other or doing something, you see two people. We didn't, we needed to have that emphasis on this is a thought happening in Nynaeve's head. And we didn't get that. We got the two shot, which doesn't draw attention to this. And then we suddenly have a Gwen, or Nynaeve going like, no matter how much I complain, I'm going to be here for you. Anyway, then they put the lantern outside and um, that's the end of that. I just would have liked more focus on this being her choice. But at the same time, I also would have liked to have seen this set up earlier as well. The rest of the episode didn't really seem to convey this. Like the reason, the previous scene would have led to, Nynaeve's reason for staying here is that she doesn't want somebody more powerful than her to come along and destroy her life or the lives of the people around her. Okay. When you write a story, you need to weave all these stories into like some main themes some main ideas. And when you have too many isolated ideas, it just feels disjointed and unorganized. And at the end you get there and you go, yeah, a lot of points were covered, but they weren't covered very satisfactorily. The final storyline that we get is Matt. Well, actually there's two more, but one's hardly mentionable. <laughs> mentionable. So we do see that Matt is a prisoner of Leandrin and she is reading the same letter to Matt that we saw Nynaeve reading to Egwene. And at the end of that letter between Nynaeve and Egwene from Perrin, um, Perrin actually mentions Matt and says like, I'm, I hope that wherever he is, he's staying out of trouble. So you can see that there was a missing him too kind of sentiment in there. But when Leandrin reads this same letter to Matt, she leaves that out and then says, Gosh, there's been a dozen of these letters and not even one mention of you in any of them. So you can tell she's trying to make him feel isolated and alone. I don't know what the purpose of all of this is. And it seems like Matt doesn't really know what the purpose is either. So I'm not sure what's going on here, but he's being held captive by Leandrin. And I think Moraine must know about this because she was the one who sent word to the Red Aja. And I don't remember, recall there being specific instructions from... Moraine to Amalisa that said, contact Leandrin of the Red Aja. She just said, get word to the Red Aja, tell them that they need to find Matt Cawthon. So I'm assuming a lot of people know that Leandrin has Matt Cawthon here. I'm, I, okay. Anyway, she's holding him prisoner. And the last thing that we see of him is that he has been using his eating utensils, sort of like Shawshank Redemption style, and he's picking the grout out between the stones in the wall to kind of try to escape. Geology is the study of pressure and time. That's all it takes, really. Pressure and time. I don't really know what to say about this. I mean, they've cast a new actor for Matt, that's fine. This is what they should have done in season one rather than change the writing, but whatever. And then we get a final shot of Rand 
seeing that he is out there in the world. He has shaved his head for some reason, and he's also hanging a lantern for Beltine. That's all we get of him. So my one major problem with this episode as a final thought is that whew, we didn't spend a lot of time with Rand or with Matt. And Matt, I can kind of see he's sort of just a tag along guy in this. I mean, they're supposed to be on the great hunt. I have no idea how they're gonna make up for all the character development that happens on their journey to try to find the horn. This book is like 90% from Rand's perspective. He goes through a lot in this. So for the show, and I heard the show's taking book two and three and smushing it together to create season two. I don't know how you could get away with a whole episode without Rand being in it and doing something. And I don't know, I mean, even though they did the thing that I thought that they should do in the first season was if you don't have something to do with this character, I was talking specifically about Perrin and Egwene walking with the Tuatha on and talking, don't have them in the episode then. Just don't, don't show them. Just, it's an episode where we skip them. And they did that here, but with Rand. And the problem is he has to go through a lot. So I'm guessing that his storyline is going to feel really crammed going forward, or they're going to have to cut a ton. And we're going to see a lot of his character development is missed. So it's either going to be contrived or we're going to have to get there some other way. And I just don't trust these writers. Overall, I do have to say, yes, the writing from line to line is better. It's not a whole lot better, but it is better. And I'm also seeing an improvement in the evidence of production value, like the White Tower actually seems to have people in it. It also has some furniture and decor, which we didn't see pretty much at all in the first season. We also have a lot more on location filming, which I really appreciate. I think that it's such a bad idea to build sets if you can shoot in a real life place. But that's all I've got for this episode. Thanks for sticking around. I hope it was fun, even though I had to cut out a ton of stuff and it's probably a lot of rambling still. But uh, anyway, please like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. If you're feeling super generous, check out my Patreon or Ko-fi or hit the money heart thanks button down below and be good to yourself. Bye.